Hello friends, it's Pastor Eli and happy Sabbath. Welcome to another wonderful event where we get to worship God, we get to uplift His name, and for me the most important part of course is sharing with you God's Word. I want to invite you to, you know, turn off your cell phones or make some space to get comfortable and we're going to listen to a children's story today. We're going to have a few announcements that I'm going to touch on very briefly before the children's story, then we're going to do our message, and then I'll come back to those announcements again at the end um, because some of them are going to require you who are at the Glenwood Springs Adventist actual location uh, to discuss a little bit. So we're going to be talking about our agape feast, we're going to be talking about communion next week, and we're going to talk about uh, a special event that's coming up. So like I said, that's just kind of a, a brief overview of what those announcements are going to be. I'm going to say this one twice so you don't forget there is a special event coming up um, in December 2nd and December 3rd um, as well as December 8 and December 9. This is going to be four different times that you can catch this special event. It is the ringing out the Christmas cheer. It's the Mountain Madrigal Singers. Um, if you remember Pastor Dave Botroff from the Rifle Church, he's going to be a part of this, as well as some other people you may recognize. Admission is free, donations are accepted, and the child care will be available for small children for free on all four of these dates. Again, those dates are on the screen now. They're December 2nd and December 8th, um, 7 p.m., and December 3rd and December 9, 2 p.m. I'll be making this announcement again at the end of our, our service so that you don't miss it. Um, the only other two announcements, like I said, are that we are having communion in one week, one week from today. So that's actually going to be the 25th, the 25th of November, right after Christmas, um, Thanksgiving. I feel like it's Christmas already. And then the night before that, on Friday the 24th, we're having a very special agape feast. Um, I'd like you guys to discuss after the message whether or not you think 6 or 6.30 works better or if it even matters. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. We're going to do some decorations. We're going to bring some food. Like I said, we'll cover those bases when we get to the end of our, of our service today. In the meantime, let's go ahead and prepare for the children's lesson, um, the eagle and the chicken. This is a very special story to me. I think that you'll enjoy it, um, but it leaves a lot to think about. So let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, as we start our service formally now, I'm praying that everybody who's watching, whether at the sanctuary in Glenwood Springs Adventist or online, Lord, I pray that each of them will be blessed by not just the children's story, but the study of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the eagle and the chickens. The eagle and the chickens is a very old story. It talks about a farmer who one day found a little hatchling, a tiny little chick, but it wasn't an ordinary chick. You see, he had on his farm cows and ducks and chickens, but he didn't have eagles. The little chick that he had found somehow was a little eagle chick. And so he took the little eagle chick and having nowhere else to put it, he put it with the mother hen who had lots of other little chickies, little chicken chicks. And this eagle grew up peeping and following the mother hen, just like the other little chicks did. But unlike the other little chicks, it was very obvious when you looked at them that the eagle was definitely not a chicken. But as the eagle grew up, it learned to peck like a chicken and to squawk like a chicken. And it learned that like a chicken, it should stay on the ground. It learned to fear like a chicken because that's all it ever saw. It would go in at night and go inside the coop. And even though it was significantly larger than some of its other chicken friends, the eagle didn't realize that it wasn't a chicken. What was really sad about this eagle is that it would never learn to fly because it was stuck inside this chicken coop. Uh, even when it was let out by the, by the farmer as it would let the chickens go out and graze and roam around, the eagle never really spread its swings because all it ever saw was chickens who couldn't fly. It didn't realize that its large, powerful wings were made for so much more. Until one day, the eagle heard something it never heard before. It heard a screeching overhead and it looked up and it saw birds with wings so wide flying overhead. And for the first time, the eagle wondered, hmm, I wonder what those are. The eagle didn't realize those were other eagles just like him. But unlike just like him, these eagles didn't grow up with chickens. They grew up with other eagles. And they had learned how to fly. They had learned how to hunt. They had learned how to do all the things that eagles do. Meanwhile, our little eagle stuck in the chicken coop had only learned how to be a chicken because those are the types of people it had grown up with. Sometimes you and I will make friendships that are really good. 
and sometimes we'll make friendships that maybe aren't so great. My invitation to you this morning, friend, is that as you grow up, you will choose your friends wisely because the people that you associate with, that you and I hang out with, those are the kinds of people we turn into. Whether you like it or not, the kinds of people that we are around have a deep impact on who we are. Likewise, I pray that you will be a good influence, that the people that you're around will be influenced by you. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly God, we're praying to you this morning because we believe that you give us the guidance, the wisdom, and the ability to make new friends every day. We're praying, Lord, that we would not be influenced by the friends that we have, but rather we would be an influence on them. Help us to be wise with the people that we choose to hang out with. Help us to not be like the eagle who thought he was a chicken, but for us to know truly that we were created for so much more. We are Christians in a world full of sinners. And while we were sinners too, we are redeemed by grace now. Please bless us as we listen to your message in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The title for this morning's message is How Change Comes About. And the reason why I chose this message for this week is I felt I felt the need after preaching last week that while it's all well and good to describe how we need to find change within ourselves, the question often doesn't get answered, which is how do I come about getting change in my life? So today's message is specifically on that. And I want to start off by uh, taking a look at our scripture for this morning, which is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Our first Bible passage is from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. And here's what it says. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And I hope that the teaching from this verse is very, very plain. But if it's not, I can summarize it into four words. Behold and be changed. This is the principle that we find in the Bible when it comes to how we find change within ourselves. Change within ourselves doesn't come from any sort of self-help or from uh, reinforcing your mind with, with you know, positive thoughts only. I mean, that's, that's the outcome that we're looking for. We're looking for a change in how we think. But how will we actually, like what, what actual steps must I do to actually find the change within myself? And so I, I want to invite you to take on the attitude or take on the practice of trying to behold something with the intent of being changed by that something. This is powerful. It's, it's kind of the basis of how the salvific experience happens. Basically, we look upon Jesus, that's to say we focus on Him, we think about Him often, we think about His life works, we think about His attitudes, His words and His teachings, His actions, His sacrifice on the cross. When you, when you spend time dedicating your mindset to thinking and focusing on that. That's to say that when, when you have negative thoughts coming into your mind, you push those aside and you say, I'm going to focus on this right now. That's what it means to behold. And so by beholding, we become change. I told the story of the eagle growing up with chickens because oftentimes we don't realize that we are God's children growing up among the broken and we ourselves are broken. Um, but witnessing others and, and focusing on the disparity of humanity will never bring about true change, never positive change within the human heart. The only thing from a biblical perspective that can actually bring about true repentance, which is a change of heart, uh, anything that is, that is true conversion, that's going to come from a relationship with God. Let me show you how Sister White, a Adventist pioneer for our church, she wrote extensively on the idea of sanctification. Part of this is because she grew up as a Methodist, and the Methodist Church, with its Wesleyan tradition, um, they have a big emphasis, and, and she also grew up with a big emphasis, on the process of going from a unsaved, unrepented, uh, unchanged human into someone who becomes more and more like Jesus over time. We share that in our Adventist DNA. I, I think that most Christians would also agree with this Wesleyan perspective on how the life of a believer changes inevitably because of contact that they have with Jesus. Let me show you some of the quotes that she had. Uh, so here we see that she uh, writes as late as, let me see, this is 1902. Here's what it says. God is ever seeking to bring human minds into association with the divine. He offers us the privilege of cooperation with Christ in revealing His grace to the world, that we may receive an increased knowledge of heavenly things. Looking unto Jesus, we obtain brighter and more distinct views of God, 
and beholding, we become changed. Good, God, goodness, sorry, love for our fellow men becomes our natural instinct. We develop a character that is the counterpart of the divine character. Growing into His likeness, we enlarge our capacity for knowing God. More and more, we enter into fellowship with the heavenly world, and we have continually increased power to receive the riches of the knowledge and wisdom of eternity. This is from Signs of the Time. Sister White is very clearly advocating for a a perspective on the Christian walk where, where the bulk of our energy is not spent on the actions that we do, but rather focusing on the actions that Jesus did, on the words that Jesus spoke. It's by beholding the true picture of Jesus as found in the Bible that we will find change within us. If we try to find the change by our own strength, by our own agency, we will fail. Oftentimes, Christians in a legalistic church or even in a legalistic lifestyle are going to find themselves disappointed at the end of the day because when you try to make yourself better, when you try to find within yourself the right intention, the right attitude for doing the right things, you're just going to wear yourself out and in the end you will fail. Even though it's possible that we can for some time maintain a, an exterior push from ourselves to say, I'm going to do this the right way real change, real lasting change will come when we behold Jesus. That's what the Bible is teaching. Maybe you disagree with the Bible. I understand that. Maybe you disagree with Sister White. I can understand that too. But I would invite you to acknowledge that if you are struggling, if you have been fighting for a long time, trying to find a difference in your life, and you just, no matter what you try, no matter what new plan you create, you just can't seem to find within yourself the substance or the perseverance to actually carry through with these plans, I'm suggesting to you this morning that the solution may be to behold Jesus. There's another quote that she reads, uh, this or, or that she writes, and it's found also in Signs of the Times. This one is from 1907. Ellen White would have been very old by this time. By this point, she had been written, writing lots and lots about the Christian experience. Let me show you what I mean. By beholding, we are to become changed. And as we meditate upon the perfections of the divine model, we shall desire to become wholly transformed and renewed in the image of His purity. It is by faith in the Son of God that transformation takes place in the character, and the child of wrath becomes the child of God. He passes from death unto life. Let me read that last, that last sentence again. It's by faith in the Son of God that transformation takes place. Okay, it's not by some other thing. It's, it's not by the efforts that you make. It's not by creating a regiment of how many times you're going to go out and feed the poor or what kind of homeless people you're going to invite into the church or how many Bible studies you have or how often you go to the church or really any of that stuff. None of the stuff that you can do, none of the good things, none of the compliments that you pay the person checking you out at uh, putting your, your items through checkout at the grocery store. All of those things, while very nice, do not actually bring about change in your life. Having the intention to be a good parent, to be kind and gentle, and, and to bring up a child in, in the way that he should go. At the end of the day, if it's not born out of us witnessing Jesus, out of, out of trusting and seeing Him and having faith in Jesus, none of that change is going to happen. Let's explore that a little bit more. So she continues saying, He passes from death unto life when He witnesses Jesus, when He, when he has faith in Him, beholding Him. He becomes spiritual and discerns spiritual things. The wisdom of God enlightens his mind, and he beholds wondrous things out of his law. As a man is converted by the truth, the work of transformation of character goes on. He has an increased measure of understanding. In becoming a man of obedience to God, he has the mind of Christ, and the will of God becomes his will. This is a beautiful teaching, friend. It's a promise to us that if we are beholding Jesus, there's nothing else you need to do. There's no other work or effort that you need to put into your Christian lifestyle in order to see real change happen. It's the, it's the conviction that if, if I would just focus on Jesus, if I would focus on how Jesus does things, if I focus on what Jesus did and what He taught and how He treated others, the attitudes that He kept, I'm going to see a change happen to me. Not a change that I'm suddenly going to have of myself, but that the change from within will be affected by a Jesus that is found within. 
How do we get Jesus inside of our minds and inside of our thoughts? We keep him there by reading about him, by talking about him, by singing about him, by making it the object of what our minds dwell on. That's, that's where we're going to find this idea of beholding Jesus. This is going to have a lot of quotes today. I, I, I'm not going to apologize because I think these are great quotes. And I like the way that Sister White writes these in a way that's just much more concise, eloquent, um, to the point than the way that I can make it. I'm, of course, I'm giving my commentary here. I hope that I'm, no one is offended by me reading these Ellen White quotes. We're Adventists, and we have a, a, a strong heritage of looking at Christian authors, especially Sister White, as, as someone who was inspired by God to write to us these things, which I believe are completely in line with what we see in Scripture. And we will come back to Scripture after a few more uh, quotes here. So let me show you another one. This one is from October 7th, also in Signs of the Time. Sister White would write to the general public, Through faith in Christ, the child of earth is made an heir of God. Again, this is entirely putting the, uh, the responsibility of change and of, and of a conviction and a, and a changed life entirely in God's hands. Not in man's hands, but in God's hands. Through faith in Christ, the child of earth is made an heir of God, joint heir with Jesus Christ. Those who behold Jesus become changed to his image, become assimilated to his nature, and the glory of God that shines in the face of Jesus is reflected in the lives of his followers. More and more, the Christian is changed from glory, uh, from, pardon me, more and more, the Christian is changed from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord, and he becomes the light of the world. The more he looks on Christ, and the more he loves and longs to look again, and the more light and love and glory he sees in Christ, the more his light increases unto the perfect day. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's important here, friend? is that this change doesn't happen because of something you did. It happens because of Jesus in you. It happens because you've beheld and you've changed. It happens because like the eagle who eventually looked up and saw the eagles up ahead, we realize we were created for so much more. At this point, I think that some of you may be thinking, okay, so, or rather the temptation is there, that we, that we hear these words, we hear about how by beholding Jesus, then we can become changed, that we're empowered. Uh, oftentimes, I've seen this happen, where people will take that to mean, ah, okay, so if I spend time in a devotion with Jesus, then now God is going to say, okay, now you can change. And then I can stop smoking, I can stop drinking, and I can, I can leave behind my addictions. Uh, I'm going to do it. Now I'll finally have the strength. Jesus will say, okay, I'm going to give you a boost here, buddy, and now you can do it. Now you can, now you can ride the bike without training wheels. And that's not necessarily what is going on here. Let me explain. Imagine for a moment that you are riding a bike and that... And that my solution for you not using training wheels anymore is, hey, you know what? Let's hit the gym. We're going to get strong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to empower you so you're stronger. Is that really what's going to make you ride your bike better? I mean, it could. But if your problem is that you're still on training wheels, the problem isn't, isn't that you're not strong enough. right? When, when the Bible talks about being empowered, it's not saying, okay, God's going to give you the okay, the thumbs up. He's going to say, hey, buddy, you can do it. You can stop sinning now. No, no, no. It's God removes sin from your life. It's not an effort on your part. At no place in the salvific experience is there a part where God says, Okay, I've taken you this far. Now, okay, buddy, go ahead. Now now you're strong enough to do this on your own. There's no place in Scripture where it talks about this experience where God decides suddenly, Okay, now you're on your own. No, the entire process is us staying connected to Jesus. Think about Jesus on this earth as our example, performing all these miracles. The Bible says he never spoke of his own accord and that he never did it on his own power, that he constantly relied only and exclusively on the Father, that even when he was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days, that at the end of that, the devil was tempting him, that's Jesus, to use his own power. And Jesus 
refused to use his own power because he was here to show us the example. Not that we need to be perfect as he is, but rather that we need to rely on God as he did, and that that alone will bring perfection. I have one more quote for you. This one is also from Signs of the Time, you guessed it, and it's from May 8th, uh, 1864. This is the earliest passage or quote or a reference that I could find where Ellen White talks about or writes about this concept about beholding and how we become changed. I think it's interesting then that we remember that we need to be wise in what we behold. It's not enough to just say, okay, we're going to focus on Jesus and that's going to be it. Because the reality is, is that there's still going to be a lot going on in our lives. We still have to go to work. We still have to raise our children. We still have to put up with one another in the church. Life goes on. I acknowledge, and I, and I want you, friend, to be realistic. You still have to look at the world, but be careful what you dwell on. Be careful what you behold, what you allow your mind to, to focus on and to meditate on and to mull over. Let me show you. Sister White wrote, by beholding, we become changed. This is the earliest mention that I could find where she uses this phrase. By beholding, we become changed. If you allow your mind to dwell upon the imperfections of moral deformities of others, you will be changed into the same image. You will become deformed in character and mentally one-sided and unbalanced. Let the mind dwell upon the perfect life of Christ. That's from Signs of the Time, May 8, 1884. I almost said 64, but I can barely read the, the font there on my notes. By beholding, I don't mean a passing glance. Beholding in this sense refers to the mind's ability to mull over and dwell on an idea. What do you find that your thoughts continue to revolve around long past when you're tired, exhausted, and you come home and you've got nothing else to worry about, when you settle down on the couch or at the dinner table? What is it that your mind wanders to? For some of us, I know that for pastors, oftentimes our minds have a hard time you know, kind of powering down and not focusing on those things anymore. We don't realize how focusing on the stress has the power to change who we are, and oftentimes not in a good way. What is it that we let our minds rest on when we turn off and when we walk away from the problems of this earth? What is it that we're letting our minds focus on? I'm not talking about what you watch on TV. I'm talking about what, what is it that, you, that your mind comes back to at night when you're laying in bed? Is it Jesus? Because if it's not, be careful, friend. You may be beholding something. You may be letting your mind behold something that is going to change you, warp you into the opposite of what you want to be. Don't be like the eagle that was caught in the chicken scoop, surrounded by negativity or, or things that were never the full potential of what he was meant to be. Instead, friend, I invite you to look on the thing, on the one whom, whose image you were created in, so that you will become more like him. Friend, I would like to end with this. Be strategic in what or whom your mind rests on. Behold Jesus. I have this in summary. If you seek change from within, you need to make a habit of beholding Jesus. Not just a habit of reading about Jesus, but rather letting, making sure that every idle thought that you have tries to see, how does this relate to what I've known about Jesus, what I've read about Jesus, what I heard about Jesus in the messages. Behold and be changed, but be wise what you behold. Choose today what you will focus on. Choose today to focus on Jesus, His life, His words his death and his resurrection. I want to finish off with this verse. This is from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul writes, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, my friend, Behold these things. I am excited to know that I feel a lot better um, considering these, these truths. That at the end of the day, if I'm focusing on Jesus, He will perform the work that He wants to see in me. If I want to see real change, if I want to see actual progress in my life in an area that I'm struggling with and have been struggling with, the solution is simple. I need to trust that Jesus is powerful enough, is real enough, to cause real change in my life, not by the effort that I put in, but because of the connection that I have to God. 
May the Lord bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly God, you are good to us. You've given us the blessing and the mercy of your grace. It is with this conviction, Lord, both in what you've written through, through Sister White, um, a leader for our church for many years, and even still today, as well as through the teachings of Jesus by your Apostle Paul. Lord, help us to always behold you and nothing else. Not our leaders, not our parents, not our friends, but you. Help us to, to bring back every idle thought back into the place where it is submitted to you, God. We're praying that this morning, this afternoon, if we've gone over time, you will bless the Glenwood Springs Church with a, a blessing of unity, of a renewed sense of wanting to be connected to you. Please bless everyone who is there and those who maybe are watching not connected, uh, connected online but not connected in person. Lord, every person that hears this message, may they be blessed with peace and with a renewed desire to behold you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friend, um, I hope that that message found you well and that it is something you can put into effect immediately in your life. Um, I want to move kind of out of the sanctity of that moment into something that I still believe is holy, uh, but maybe not as reverent. And that's getting ready for our wonderful agape feast that we're planning and we've been uh, kind of planning here and there. Now it's time for like the actual planning to happen. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person to kind of help shepherd us all along, but I think you all are mature enough that it shouldn't be too bad trying to figure out who's going to do what. Um, so the three, um, the three announcements that I had, we're going to have that concert, which I was talking about. So that's uh, ringing out the Christmas cheer. It's in Glenwood Springs. It is at the, oh boy, what does that say? Um, that is at the Christian, boy, where's this at? Glenwood Church of Christ. Uh, okay, so that's Glenwood Church of Christ. This font is incredibly difficult to read. I'm so sorry, guys. It says Glenwood Church of Christ, 260 um, Soccer Field Road, Glenwood Springs. Um, it's going to be indoors. It, they've got a very nice uh, acoustic setup there at that church. Um, like I said, we, we're going to have some of our rifle Adventist members are going to be participating. Uh, it's going to be very nice. They're, it's free admission. They will pick up a donation on plates. Uh, these are the dates again. That's December 2nd and December 8th, December 3rd, December 9th. Um, 7 p.m. for those first two dates, 2 p.m. for the second two dates. I will be texting the, the church group um, this image and the details in a font that is much easier to read, I hope. Um, but yeah, ringing out the Christmas cheer. I know which songs are going to be on there. My wife and I are planning to be there December 3rd um, at 2 p.m., for this wonderful event. We're expecting to really enjoy it. We're taking our girls there. We hope to see you there. If you choose to go December 3rd, uh, maybe we can start a group chat and decide which date is going to be best for us. Regardless, um, I'm looking forward to that. I hope that you can make it. The other two things that I had on here is that we have communion the 25th. That is one week from today when you are watching this, unless you're watching this online on Friday, in which case, okay. Eight days away. Um, yeah, next week, the 25th, right after the, uh, on, on Thanksgiving week, we're going to have communion. So please be ready. Um, if that means you don't want to come, I completely understand. Um, I, I believe that this is a wonderful opportunity to wash each other's feet, reconcile, um, have a sense of community again. And the night before that, on Friday, which is kind of our last little uh, announcement here, before you leave today, please check with Crystal and Luis on or Peter and Dita or anybody that's there. Just get together and let me know who's bringing what. Here's kind of the items that uh, I think are necessary. Um, if, if we could have some people bring some sourdough, um, I hear that Janelle makes some wonderful sourdough. I'm planning to bring some as well from one of the members out here in Palisade that she makes wonderful sourdough as part of her business. I'm sure I can bring a few loaves. If everyone could bring a chili or a soup, uh, doesn't have to be big, just something to share with so we can kind of make it kind of like a potluck style, but focused on the soup slash chili, something that'll be nice for an agape feast. This is just kind of like a little Mediterranean style type of uh, get together. Um, we need somebody to bring grapes. I believe that the Taurus are bringing nuts and cashews, um, Luis and Crystal Taurus, and I know that Tom Ice said that he could bring some um, cashews, I think it was. Um, we need to bring some juices or drinks. I can provide juice. Um, I have two bottles of Welch's grape juice. 
Um, cheese, if somebody could bring some cheese, we can make this our charcuterie, charcuterie board kind of style thing. Just something simple. Uh, maybe some butter, if somebody wants to bring that and anything else you guys would like to do. Again, this is November 24th at 6 p.m. if that time works for you guys. Hopefully that was enough time for you to see my little list there. Um, one more thing that I need, it's, it's tied with the Agape Feast. I am planning to make it up early with my wife to, um, to set up and decorate. If you happen to be available to help us decorate, that would be really lovely. If you could also let me know, maybe Dita, if you know what decorations there are, um, or anybody who knows what decorations there are currently at the church, that would be really helpful if you want to look through before you leave today. Um, let's make it really pretty. We're, we're hoping to do candles and maybe some, some nice uh, table runner there, some, some nice kind of fall decorations. Um, having grapes on the tables would be really nice. Let's go ahead and do that there where we usually have our potlucks um, in the Sabbath school room. It's going to be wonderful. I'm really looking forward to it. It's, it's kind of a reverent uh, but friendly type of event. Not overly serious, just serious enough that it gets us ready and into the mindset of our communion the following day. Um, I may need to talk to somebody about um, having somewhere to stay since it's going to be kind of late for me and my girls. Um, traveling all the way back to Grand Junction and then back again for the communion service the the Sabbath right after the Sabbath morning right after that um, I may need to stay at someone's house um, I don't know we'll talk about that we'll talk about that but yeah friends thank you so much for listening to today's message um, I pray that your discussion time will be fruitful and that you will get to be able to make this agape feast and communion service happen nice and well uh, this coming week okay see you guys next week.